thank the organizers for inviting me with this wonderful occasion. So with Yvonne, uh, of course, uh, I know her for essentially at the beginning of my career, maybe the first year after I finished my PhD. I remember discussing with her the global existence. I remember being very intrigued of one of the examples uh, that she has uh, for nonlinear wave equations in three dimensions, where she, she showed that, in principle, you could not have global existence. Uh, fortunately, it happened, it's <coughs> happened that the Einstein equations had better structure. So in the end, uh, we could prove the stability of Minkowski space, uh, together with Kistodulu. It's also Yvonne who, in a sense, indirectly was responsible for getting Kistodulu and I together. Uh, Christodoulou has, in fact, uh, visited you for a, a year or two years. Uh, and uh, I think that's when she, he started to think about the stability of Minkowski space. I, I did it in a different way. Anyway, we met and, uh, and uh, we uh, both felt that uh, our subject started, in a sense, with Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne's great work in the 1952, which opened somehow the, the whole subject of general relativity. Because to, to me, the, sub the subject of general relativity, or the, at least classical general relativity, is really the subject of the initial value problem, which obviously started with Yvonne. And in general, I should say that uh, it is here in France that the initial value problem was in, in general relativity was uh, seriously developed with Loret, Yvonne choquet and I guess Lichnerowitz. And, uh, and uh, uh, I don't think, I think it was really just in France. I don't think there was any, any uh, I mean, people are not interested in the initial value problem, at least uh, outside France. And uh, <laughs> at the personal level, of course, Yvonne has always been extremely uh, warm and, and uh, encouraging. And uh, I always had a very good time uh, whenever I meet her. And uh, happy birthday, Yvonne. All right, so I, my, the subject of my talk is on the reality of black holes. Uh, OK, happy birthday. So here is what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, uh, I'll discuss very fast uh, what I mean by reality. Uh, then I introduce black holes, and I talk about the main issues uh, that have to do with uh, what I call reality of black holes, which are rigidity, stability, and, and collapse. And uh, first of all, here is a, a picture of uh, sort of a, a cartoon picture of what I mean by reality. So you see here, it's, it's what you can call uh, perception of reality that's happening here on Earth. Here you have physics, which in some sense uh, takes uh, sort of a, a middle way between what one might call mathematical reality. A lot of mathematical equations come, come up here, which of course are intimately tied to uh, things that happen in the real world. And uh, then of course here you have subjects such as uh, classical mechanics, geometry. Geometry was maybe the first uh, subject within mathematics that clearly started with observations in physical reality or observation in perceptual reality, if you want, uh, Pythagoras theorem and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then they developed, all these subjects developed uh, sort of independently after that within a mathematical framework. And that's the way I want to think about general relativity also. is a subject which, of course, started here. Uh, it went there. Uh, it was formulated by Einstein in his uh, famous uh, Einstein field equations. But then somehow uh, we can think about the subject as being a subject who's in mathematics. And now it's <coughs> just in the same way as, as geometry was developed uh, independently to some extent from where it started with, but nevertheless having a deep contact uh, to physics. In particular, uh, it led later on to, as we know, to general relativity. Uh, I want to think about also about general relativity as a subject which is purely a mathematical subject, but which has intimately connections with the physical world. So, uh, so this is a cartoon picture of what I mean. Now, uh, this is what one might call mathematical reality. And you see there are subjects like, like geometry, partial differential equations, general relativity, which are intimately in interconnected and which develop within, within uh, 
I mean, have th this would be sort of <laughs> the image of physical uh, reality, and uh, this is how uh, the subjects develop within mathematics. So uh, uh, now, uh, more seriously, <laughs> the issue of uh, what I call reality uh, of uh, black holes is has to do with the question as whether physical reality can be tested by mathematical means in the framework of a given theory. So in particular, uh, in the case of general relativity, black holes are well known to be special solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations. Uh, and, uh, but they do also, so uh, they, they also have uh, physical meaning in the sense that, uh, uh, as we all know, in astrophysics, uh, one expects that there are plenty of black holes uh, in the universe, uh, in particular in the center of galaxies. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, whether, uh, whether they are uh, really tied to the special solutions of the Einstein equations can be debatable. In any case, uh, I won't talk about the astrophysical side of it. I will talk about the mathematics. And the point I want to make is that one can formulate the issue of reality of black holes in purely mathematical language. So, uh, okay, so are, they, uh, are these uh, objects, which are obviously uh, uh, important in astrophysics, as, are they real? And the question is, the, the question that I'm asking can be uh, formulated in mathematical language in the following way. So, uh, so stas stationary asymptotic and flat solution of the Einstein field equations in vacuum. Uh, in other words, are, I'm, I'm only interested in, yeah, I, I should say that, of course, the Einstein vacuum equations refer to uh, equations which are tied to uh, a particular matter field. For simplicity, I would just take the matter field to be, uh, to be zero. In other words, I'm looking at the Einstein vacuum equations. And as we, as we know, black holes are simply stationary solutions of, uh, of the Einstein equations, Einstein vacuum equations. And, uh, uh, the definition of a black hole, or more precisely, an external black hole, is asymptotic. <coughs> so an external black hole is really an asymptotically flat, regular Lorentzian manifold with boundaries, uh, deformorphic to the complement of a cylinder in R1 plus 3. I'll make this a little bit more clear in a second. And uh, uh, in addition uh, to being a solution of the Einstein vacuum equations, it also satisfies, they are, it, it's also asymptotically uh, flat, uh, and it has a killing vector field, which is asymptotically timelike, uh, and uh, the lead derivative of the metric relative to t is equal to zero. That's a definition of a killing vector field. So that's, that's a definition of a, a mathematical definition of a black hole. And uh, we have ex explicit solutions of such black holes. So the, uh, the Kerr family, depending on two parameters, which is expressed in this Bohr link with coordinates here. Uh, so never mind exactly uh, the precise expression uh, that you have. The important thing uh, to keep in mind is that uh, the solutions have two killing vector fields, one which is uh, d over dt, uh, which <laughs> is reflected in the fact that all the coefficients of the metric are time independent, do not depend on t. The coordinates are t, r, t, and phi. And uh, a second kinetic vector field, which is just the derivative with respect to phi. Right? So this is, uh, this is a Kerr solution. And of course, a particular case of the Kerr solution is a Schwarzschild solution, in which case a is equal to 0, m is strictly positive. And the solution in this case is static and spherically symmetric. So it's a little bit more than stationary. And I won't say more than, than this at this stage. Uh, so here is a, a, a Penrose diagram of uh, the Kerr solution. So, uh, so here you have the two ends uh, of the Kerr solution. This is the horizon, r equal r plus. r plus is a solution of, the, of uh, delta, which is, which is this uh, quantity here. Uh, and uh, uh, and of course, uh, in the black hole region, the black hole region terminates with, with the Cauchy horizons, which are r minus, r equal r minus. 
which is the other solution of the delta equal to 0. Uh, external regions, you have these two external regions here, uh, which are asymptotically flat. So you have a, a scry, scry plus and scry minus. Uh, again, the event horizon is r equal r plus. And uh, when we talk about the external black hole, we talk about uh, this region up to the event horizon. So this is sort of the observable region. Of course, we cannot see what happens in the uh, black hole region. All right, so uh, <coughs> again, this is another picture of the uh, external care solution. That's this one. It corresponds to a, a rotating black hole. Uh, again, stationary, they are, this solution is stationary are axisymmetric. Uh, they have, uh, uh, in the external region, there are no trap surfaces in the sense of Penrose. Of course, there are plenty of, tra of trap surfaces within the black hole region. Uh, there is a non-trivial ergo region uh, in which the energy, which corresponds to this vector field t. So this is a Kinnick vector field, the stationary Kinnick vector field, which is time-like uh, far away from the black hole. But it can become uh, space-like in the vicinity of the black hole, exactly in the ergo region, in fact. All right. So, uh, and of course, this leads to all sorts of difficulties, both physically, mathematically. Mathematically, the uh, the major difficulty connected with it is that the energy, which is associated to the vector field, is non-positive in the region where t is space-like. Uh, so, and then finally, there are trap null geodesics. Uh, in other words, there exist null geodesics. So typical null geodesic, uh, which unfortunately here we cannot see. They, are, uh, they only see the only trap null geodesic. The only sorry, the only null geodesic that we can see in the picture are the radial ones, uh, which can either go to scry plus or can go to the to the black hole. Uh, but in fact, there are also uh, more complicated type of uh, null geodesics. Uh, which are trapped. For example, in Schwarzschild, they are trapped exactly at the value r equals 3m. And this is another major uh, technical difficulty uh, in connection with the math mathematical study of black holes. OK, so this, uh, <coughs> this is sort of a quick description of uh, black holes. So now, what are the questions, which I call reality questions of the black holes? The first one is rigidity. And uh, this. <laughs> is a question of uh, whether, besides the Kerr family, which uh, we described earlier, whether there are any other uh, possible black room, uh, I should say, exhaust all possible vacuum black holes. In other words, uh, there are no other uh, stationary black hole solutions which are asymptotically flat, uh, and which are solutions of the Einstein vacuum equations. So this is a famous uh, issue of rigidity, and I'll say a few words about it later on. The second question, which is, a, which is even more important from the point of view of reality, is the issue of stability. Uh, so here the question is, uh, well, uh, can be formulated in terms of the initial value problem, as we shall see in a second. And uh, obviously, uh, there is an initial value uh, or initial data set, rather, which is associated to a precise care solution. And uh, you'd like to know what happens if you make small perturbations uh, of, uh, of that initial data set. And of course, if uh, the perturbations grow, then uh, it, this will correspond to the fact that the black hole is unstable. And obviously, if the black hole is unstable, it, it doesn't have any physical reality either, because of course, uh, of course, uh, uh, th there is no pure black hole, right? So uh, any perturbation, if a, if a small perturbation of a black hole would lead to something entirely different, then black holes, in the sense we understand in astrophysics, do not exist. So that's uh, uh, that's the issue of uh, stability. And finally, the last is that of collapse, namely, <laughs> typically black hole forms, as we know, form from collapsing uh, collapsing uh, uh, stars, for example. And uh, uh, in other words, somehow you'd like to, in order to formulate the issue of collapse, you'd like to start, again, from the point of view of the initial data, you'd like to start with the initial conditions. 
which are uh, non-trapped in the sense of Penrose. So there are no black holes originally. And uh, you like to show that a black hole, you like to understand what is the mechanism of formation of a black hole, how a black hole could form from regular initial conditions. So that's the issue of collapse. And I, I think you'll all agree with me that these are reali all these are reality issues of, uh, of black holes. Right? So any questions about this? So this is, these are the sort of the main problems that I want to talk about. All right? <laughs> okay. So OK, of course, in initial value problem, again, uh, famous result of Yvonne choquet brouard which started the whole thing. Right? So, so you, uh, you start up with an initial data set, which is a, a three uh, manifold together with a Riemannian metric, G0, and the second fundamental form, K0, which satisfies the constraint equations. And uh, we are looking at the development of this uh, initial data set. OK, so these are the issues. So now let's talk uh, about each one of them in more detail. So let me start with the rigidity conjecture. Uh, which is, in, in some sense, the simplest uh, question connected to reality. So again, the Kerr family, so the conjecture says that the Kerr family KAM, with A between 0 and M, exhausts all stationary asymptotically flat black vacuum black holes. So what's known about it? First of all, there is a, a, a famous result due to Carter Robinson, which says that uh, the rigidity uh, is indeed correct if you also assume axial symmetry. In other words, you look at space-time, which are not only stationary, but they're also they're axially symmetric. So in, in this case, the problem is completely solved. Uh, of course, uh, there were many, the, the original results are due to Carter Robinson, but there are many issues which I think have been completely solved, uh, in particular by Piotr. Okay? So this is very well understood. <laughs> Now, uh, the general conjecture, of course, uh, uh, has no axial symmetry in it. So the question is, what happens if you don't have axial symmetry? There is a, a result of Hawking, uh, which I think it's a fake result, in the sense that he makes a huge assumption, uh, which is the assumption of analyticity. And there is uh, really no reason. I mean, it's, a, it's an assumption which is completely ad hoc. There is absolutely no reason that solution of the Einstein equation, stationary solution of the Einstein equation, should be analytic. But nevertheless, in, the, in this case, uh, the result is true in the sense that what, what he does is he shows that under the analyticity assumption, you can construct a second killing vector field, which will be axial, axially symmetric. And therefore, he reduces the problem to the Carter Robinson. But in doing it, he uses analyticity, which roughly, so the reason I think it's a cheat is because it's essentially uh, giving up on the Einstein equations altogether. He's not using Einstein equations. He's using instead the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which is funny. I mean, all of a sudden, you, you throw out the Einstein equations. The Einstein equations are used very little in, in this result. I mean, almost sort of in a trivial way, I would say. And then uh, after that, the problem is purely one of uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which has nothing to do with the Einstein equations. So, uh, so this, I think, it's a fake result. So the, the real issue is what happens if you don't assume analyticity. And uh, the problem becomes infinitely more complicated. And uh, the, here are the results that we have so far. So for a general Ricci flat, again, so Ricci flat, so the Einstein vacuum equations, smooth, so we're looking at smooth solutions, uh, then uh, uh, you, you have uh, uh, this result, which is uh, together with Alexa Alexakis and Ionescu, uh, which says that if you have a space time which is stationary and it's also closed in some very special, uh, I mean, in some very geometric sense, which you can make very precise, it's very close to a care space time, then it must be care. Okay, so it's a sort of a local rigidity result. Uh, and uh, there are actually many improvements of these results, more, more recent improvements in the sense of making it more precise what you mean by close. So for example, in the original result, we had close everywhere, while it turns out that uh, you, we have better results where you have to make assumptions only on the bifurcate sphere. Uh, by the way, this, all these results require uh, non-degenerate spacetime. So we don't have anything in the degenerate case. There is no result in the degenerate case in the category of smooth solutions of the Einstein equations. 
All right, so, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, one result. And then, of course, we, then we have some other results, which are, in some sense, uh, connected with it, but uh, of independent interest. So for example, I want to mention two. So we have a very, I should say, here is a sort of a, a very simple version of uh, uniqueness, of rigidity. Assume that you have a metric, G, which is Ricci flat. And actually, it doesn't even have to be Lorentzian, and it can be any dimension. So this is a sort of a very general result. It's Ricci flat, any dimension, and it doesn't even have to be Lorentzian. It can be pseudo-Riemannian. And uh, you have a Killing vector field, K, uh, which is defined in a domain D, included in, in space-time. And, uh, and you, look at, uh, you look at the point. So, so K is killing here, only here, only inside. And you are looking at a point, P, where a certain condition, which is called the pseudo-convexity <coughs> pseudo condition. So there is, this, this condition is essential. If the pseudo-convexity condition is satisfied, then K can be extended past, uh, past D in a small neighborhood of that point. And this condition goes back to the calderon hermander so the pseudo-convexity condition, which is the general condition for in partial differential equations. And uh, uh, if, of course, if you have analyticity, this result is trivial, and you don't need the Einstein equations. Okay? But in the smooth category, you need this. It's essential. And you also need the pseudo-convexity condition. And in fact, <laughs> we have counterexample if the p-convexity condition is violated. So for example, uh, here is a very simple uh, case. You see, if you, if you look at the black hole region of a Kerr solution. Okay? And this is the event horizon. This is a bifurcate sphere. So I if you are exactly at the bifurcate sphere, you can show that uh, there exists a second killing vector field. So you, I, I'm talking about, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about a stationary solution uh, which coincides with the Kerr solution inside here. Okay? And, uh, and uh, the result is that you can always find uh, points, on the uh, points on the horizon which are not on the bifurcate sphere. So on the bifurcate sphere, this pseudo-convexity condition is satisfied. But if you are outside the bifurcate sphere, uh, pseudo-convexity is violated. And in fact, you can construct counterexamples to, uh, to this uh, local extension result in the sense that you can find solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation which are carried here, stationary everywhere in this neighborhood but for which the second kinetic vector field does not extend. So it's not axially symmetric. Right? So this is, uh, I think, <laughs> another sort of interesting result in connection with, uh, uh, with this stuff. OK, so that's uh, rigidity. All right, so <laughs> I leave stability for the end, and I'll talk uh, very fast about the collapse. So here, the question is, can black holes form starting from reasonably initial data configurations? And it's intimately tied to the issue of formation of trap surfaces. So the trap surfaces in the sense of Penrose. So I'll talk about uh, very fast about Christodoulou's trapping theorem from 2008. This was a major breakthrough in the field. Then uh, improvements by Rodniansky and myself. And finally, a, a re a recent results of uh, Rodniansky, Luke, and myself. Uh, which is, uh, I think, an important extension of, uh, of Christodoulou's theorem. All right, so uh, let me recall very fast the Penrose uh, singularity theorem. <laughs> so uh, you have a space time which doesn't even have to be Ricci flat. All you, you have to assume that Ricci in the direction of a vector field L, which is null for the metric G, has to be strictly positive. So you have these positive conditions satisfied. M contains a non compact Cauchy hypersurface. So that's a topological condition. Uh, but the most important one is that M contains a closed trap surface, which I'll explain in a second what it is. Then the space time has to be future geodesically, null geodesically incomplete. Okay, so that's uh, the singularity theorem. It's really not a singularity theorem, it's an incompleteness theorem. Okay? It, because it doesn't tell you anything about you know, any kind of uh, information about how, things, how singularities form. But it's a very important result. In particular, what's very important is this notion of a trap surface. So what is a trap surface? Well, 
it's a surface which has the properties that if you look at all perpendicular null geodesics, you have two families of perpendicular null geodesics. One which is typically incoming. Even in Minkowski space, you have one that's going like this. And the other one in Minkowski space will, go, will be outgoing. Now, if you have a trapped surface, uh, it, uh, it means that, uh, that uh, both uh, uh, families of null geodesics are actually contracting, in, in the sense that the, the uh, two areas, uh, if I go along null geodesics, or <laughs> relative to an affine parameter, I see that the areas in both directions are decreasing. Instead, one should be increasing, and the other should be decreasing, as in Minkowski space. Now, both are decreasing. Uh, this has to be a pointwise condition. So this has to, ha to happen any everywhere. It can be measured in terms of what is called the expansion associated to uh, null geodesics, which are, in fact, traces of uh, so-called null second fundamental form, which are geometric objects associated to the two surface. OK, anyway, so let, let, I don't want to say much more than this. Uh, the question is, can these trap surfaces form in evolution? So in, in the result of Penrose, you assume that you have such a trap surface. And the question is, can such trap surfaces form in evolution? Right? So can, in other words, can I start up with initial data, which is free of trap surfaces, and form a trap surface later on? <coughs> right. So. Uh, the second question is, that does the existence of a trap surface imply the presence of a black hole? So this, again, is a major issue. A trap surface is a local condition, where, of course, a, a black hole is something global that has to be defined from infinity. Uh, it turns out that uh, this statement is true if the weak cosmic censorship uh, holds true, which is, of course, an even uh, more difficult conjecture to prove. So, But uh, it, it's at least interesting to notice that all these things are consistent. So the, the weak cosmic censorship is another major conjecture in general relativity. Uh, OK, but I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, the more important question that can be answered, and in fact was answered, is uh, this one, can singularities form starting with non-isotropic initial configuration? So this is the new result of Jonathan, uh, of Luke, uh, Rodniansky, and myself. So. Again, this is a picture that you must have in mind. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, I don't know exactly why do I have this picture here. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it in a second. OK. Right, so again, problem specify an open set of regular initial conditions free of trap surfaces. But now. <laughs> I can specify this either on space-like hypersurface or on a null hypersurface. Okay, so let me make it a little bit more precise. In a sec so in the next slide, I'll make it a little bit more precise. Uh, now, the formation of trapped surfaces is pretty well known in the case of spherical symmetry. If you have spherical symmetric space-times, and you know, for example, Dimitris Christodoulou, uh, in his famous results on uh, on spherical symmetric solutions of the Einstein equations coupled with a scalar field. You always need, in spherical symmetry, you need to couple the Einstein equations with, with, a, with a field. Otherwise, you have non-trivial, you, you cannot have non-trivial solutions, non-trivial dynamics. Uh, so in the spherical symmetric case, he has sort of very general conditions for formation of trap surfaces, which were extremely important in his program. Now, uh, uh, if you don't have spherical symmetry, then the dynamics of the Einstein equations are infinitely more complicated. And it's not at all clear what would be the mechanism. In particular, what would be the mechanism in vacuum? I mean, the expectations, at least from as far as physical intuition is concerned, is that trap surfaces and black holes will form as collapse of matter. Okay? Now, uh, Dimitris Kistodoro is actually uh, able to show that, it's, that the issue has nothing to do with matter, can be understood purely in terms of uh, the vacuum Einstein equations. So uh, now, the major difficulty here is that you need to control the space time. So you need to control the, the entire dynamics of the space time for a very long time. So it's not a local existence result. You have to go beyond Yvonne's local existence result, go much further, and be able to uh, 
understand the details of uh, a space-time for given initial conditions, the initial conditions themselves cannot be too small. They have to be actually quite large in order to produce a trap surface. Anyway, uh, this, uh, this is a thing that uh, Christodoulou has done. So basically, this is a picture. Uh, so that's the picture uh, with a fake higher dimensions in it. Otherwise, I, I have to restrict myself to just two dimensions. Uh, here you have a null hypersurface, which is an outgoing null hypersurface. This, uh, this is an incoming null hypersurface. And in, as we know, in order to solve the initial data, characteristic initial data, you, you need to put conditions both here and here. Okay. So uh, he picks up the conditions here to be Minkowskian. So this is trivial. While uh, here he takes a short pulse, which uh, corresponds to some relatively large initial conditions, free of trap surfaces. And then he shows that a space time can be defined and controlled in full details, can be controlled for a long time. You see, if this is of size delta here, and you have a short pulse of size delta, then the space time had be controlled up to something of size one, which is quite far. Okay? So this is way beyond the local existence result. But uh, uh, nevertheless, he can do it. So he can prove a semi-global existence result with detailed control. And then if, in addition, you pick up <laughs> special initial conditions, which can, he can identify very precisely, uh, Within the class for which this is true, for which this control is true, then uh, you form a trap surface somewhere here. Okay? So even though there are no trap surfaces here, and of course no trap surfaces here, you will form a trap surface later on. So, uh, so a similar result uh, is also given with data at past null infinity. So you can imagine going uh, from past null infinity, and you get sort of a similar result. In fact, the the, the important part of the result is really the local result. Once you have the local result, you can easily extend it to past null infinity. OK, so the, the theorem that, uh, that uh, I mentioned earlier, which is that one of uh, Rodiansky, Luke, and myself, is uh, different in the following sense. So you see, it's very important in Christodoulou's result that at, at, at uh, here, the data that you pick up in order to form a trap surface is uniformly sufficiently large in all directions. Okay? While in this new result, we prove that it suffices to get something which is large along one null direction. Right? So you pick up initial data which is large in one null direction. In fact, it can be flat everywhere else. Okay? And you still form a trap surface later on. But the trap surface is more complicated. You see, in, in, the, in the work of Christodoulou, the, the trap surface is obtained by, uh, well, you define the space time, which is this one here. You define it in terms of a double null foliation. So relative to a double null foliation, uh, you form a trap surface which corresponds exactly to the double null foliation. While in the new result, you still have the double null foliation because you need to control the space time. In fact, the result still relies. This our result still relies on the first step here, but uh, uh, but now uh, I can take initial data which is concentrated in just in one direction, and uh, you form a trap surface. But the trap surface is not going to be at the intersection of the of the leaves of the double null foliation, but it, it's rather going to be a deformation of it. In other words, it, it, in order to prove this result, you have to combine somehow the mechanism of Christodoulou together with a new mechanism which corresponds to a deformation argument along the incoming null geodesics. Okay? So, uh, okay, so it combines all ingredients in Christodoulou's theorem with a deformation argument against along the incoming null hypersurfaces. In other words, along this. And that's why you, get sort of the, you can get a very complicated surface like this. And the condition for producing such a thing, of course, has to be put on the initial condition. It's just a differential inequality. It's fa in fact, it's an elliptic PD, nonlinear PD that has to be satisfied. So you, you pick up your initial data to, to satisfy a nonlinear elliptic PD, which is not too different from what comes up in the uni uniformization theorem. And, uh, and that will produce a singularity. Are you saying that if you have only one ultra-high energy graviton, yes. 
you will form. Yeah, right. It's basic. I'll, I'll explain. I, I don't want to go through the proof now because they want to talk about something else, but uh, I can tell you more about it. All right, so here is uh, the last uh, aspect of reality of black holes I want to talk about, which is the stability issue, so, which is, of course, the most important one, I would say. Because once again, if, if stability is not satisfied, there is no way you can talk about black holes as physical objects. So, uh, so this is, a, of course, a fundamental issue which has been studied quite a bit. Uh, the conjecture is the following. So the stability of the external, in other words, I'm looking at stability of this region. <laughs> okay? So you, you pick up initial conditions on a space-like hypersurface, and uh, you can imagine that the care itself, the restriction of care itself, gives you a, a set of initial conditions on this hypersurface, and you perturb it a little bit, and you like to prove that the perturbation leads to a space-time uh, which uh, 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 converges asymptotically to another care solution. Not necessarily the same. It's very important, and in fact, it's one of the difficulties of the problem that the final state may not be the original care solution you started with. All right, so that's a picture. And uh, uh, so I want to say what, I want to talk a little bit about general stability issues in partial differential equations. So, uh, well, imagine a nonlinear equation. I don't want to make it very precise, but it's n of phi 0 plus phi is equal to 0. I guess I need the, the bigger one now. <laughs> right. This way. Yes. All right. So, uh, so this is, this is a, a no, imagine a nonlinear partial differential equation, which has a stationary solution, which is phi 0. So phi 0 is a solution that you can think is independent of time, right? That's basically what stationarity means. Of course, in GR, it's more complicated, but roughly, that's what it is. And uh, well, how do you, and obviously, psi denotes the perturbation, so you'd like to show that the perturbation remains small or converges even to zero uh, for all time. Okay? So asymptotically, you look in the uh, direction of future time, and you'd like to show that psi tends to, either tends to zero, or maybe it tends to something else. But in any case, you, you have to control psi. You have to control the perturbation. So how do you do that? Well, typically, you linearize. So you linearize around phi 0, because you, you are making a perturbation of phi 0. You linearize, you get a linear operator applied to psi. So psi is a perturbation, plus something which is quadratic in the psi, right? which has to be equal to 0. And this L operator is really the Frechet derivative of, uh, of this n. Okay? Right? So that's, so far, nothing, uh, nothing special. And then, of course, you have to look at the linearized equations. And in a first approximation, you have to show that the linearized equations are well-behaved. In other words, the solution of these equations do not behave badly. And uh, uh, then uh, there is uh, orbital stability. Uh, you can distinguish between no the various notions of stability, like orbital stability and asymptotic stability. Orbital stability will be that psi remains bounded for all time. Asymptotic stability, psi converges to 0 as t goes to infinity. Now. Uh, it turns out, actually, that orbital stability you can almost never prove. In other words, in order to prove this, you will have to prove this. So you, you always have to prove the stronger version. Uh, and uh, modulo, of course, something that I'll talk about later. Uh, whenever you have a quasi-linear equations, in particular, there is no chance that you'll be able to do something like this directly. You'll have to prove that something much stronger, which is the asymptotic stability. Now, the simplest case is, of course, that of constant phi 0. So phi 0 is a, is a constant solution. For example, Minkowski space, if you think in terms of stability of Minkowski space, the Minkowski corresponds to something which is constant, you could say, and you want to perturb around it. Uh, in that case, the linearized equations uh, can be analyzed. And, uh, 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 and in order to prove the asymptotic stability, you need not only uh, that psi is bounded, for example, that the perturbation remains bounded, but you also need to, to actually get decay. So you want to, to find the rate of decay of how psi converges to 0 as t goes to infinity. All right, so in the stationary case, however, the situation is much more complicated. So if phi 0 is not a constant, but it's a general stationary solution, like the Kerr solution, uh, then uh, uh, 
then, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not even clear that you converge to the same phi zero. You can perturb a phi zero and converge to a completely different one. So this is the issue of modulation, which you can analyze in a very simple uh, example. So, uh, so this is, for example, take the equation, take the simplest possible wave equation, which is uh, the one above. So wave equation equal phi to a p. Uh, where p, is, let's say, is quadratic. The most natural case would be p equal 2. And uh, uh, it's very easy to prove perturbations of phi 0 equal to 0. Phi 0 equal to 0 is, of course, a solution. It's very easy to prove perturbations of that. But it's much more complicated to prove perturbation uh, of uh, a larger class of solutions, which are stationary. So it turns out that that equation has uh, solutions which depend only on x, which you can write down explicitly, and depend on a parameter a, which, is can, which can easily be obtained by scaling. Uh, and uh, uh, a typical perturbation, actually, maybe p should be cubic. You know, that, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter at this, po at, at this point. It should have cubic, and it should have the, right sign, the wrong sign. In other words, the energy is not positive in that case. Uh, anyway, what I wanted to say is that this is what you want to perturb, and uh, 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 the, the solutions that you obtain uh, to the nonlinear problem when you do this perturbation argument may not converge to the same uh, A0. So if you start with an A0, you may conver converge to a different one, or it may not converge at all. I mean, it could be that the problem is unstable, which is actually the case in this case, and then you don't converge to anything else. And uh, uh, that has led to in recent years, in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, this has led to lots of th this type of issues. Uh, in other words, perturbation around stationary solution has led to a lot of work, uh, which is, I'll call it modulation theory, uh, or it's known under the name of modulation theory. And of course, uh, there are many people who have contributed, in particular, uh, Frank Merrill and his school uh, here in France. All right, so let me. Uh, <laughs> get to the issue of black hole stability. So what are the difficulties? How much time do I have? I don't know when I started, actually. 10 minutes, approximately? OK, so I don't have to rush, OK. <laughs> so, uh, so what are the difficulties? So obviously, this is a very simple problem by comparison. Right? So here you have just a scalar equation. You have only one phi. The nonlinearity is very simple and already is very complicated. In the case uh, of the stability of the case solution, uh, the difficulties are are made much more difficult, are made m much tougher uh, because of first of all the gauge covariance of the equations. Right? So you you know, I mean, a solution is, is expressed in terms of say a coordinate system, but depending on which coordinate system you take, the problem may look very very different. So that's a huge, huge problem. This was a huge problem in the stability of Minkowski space. Uh, you can then, of course, <laughs> wonder about linearization. Linearization is intimately tied to the, the problem of gauge covariance. Because if you write down the equation in a certain gauge, you linearize in that gauge, the linearization will be heavily dependent on the gauge. So this is a huge problem. And it leads to all sorts of possibilities in terms of how you want to linearize. You can linearize relative to metric coefficients. In other words, you write everything relative to a coordinate system. You can do relative to the connection coefficients. By the way, the connection coefficients turn out to be very useful in the bounded delta curvature conjecture, which was recently proved uh, with uh, Jeremy and Rodiansky. Uh, so, so this can be very useful in some cases. You can do it relative to the curvature components. This was stability of Minkowski space was done relative to curvature. Uh, and uh, well, there is this issue of modulation because you don't know a priori where you are converging to, right? So you have to also keep that in mind as a major difficulty. All right. So uh, linear problem. Once, let's say, once you assume that you have solved this problem and you found sort of a good description of, uh, of uh, how to linearize, you, now you have to study the li linear problem. And for the linear problem, you need the uniform decay estimates, which are sufficiently strong. If they are not strong enough, you're not, you cannot prove asymptotic 
uh, stability. So for example, in, in order to prove the stability of Minkowski space, you have to show that the curvature decay at certain rates, uh, which are polynomial rates, and they have to be very precise. If you don't have the precise rates, you just don't get the result. Uh, now, in the case of CARE, you have this issue that you have limited symmetries even for the care solution itself. So the care has only two vector fields which are killing. Minkowski space has lots, a lot more. Uh, so the stability of Minkowski space we expect to be simple because of this. Limited symmetry. Presence of the ergo region, this is a major problem because now you don't even have a positive energy to start with. Right? So this is absolutely uh, fundamental. Presence of a trap region, all the estimates uh, degenerate in the trap region. I'll say a few words later on. And uh, of course, uh, quasi-linear nature, in the sense that uh, the characteristics of the equations uh, differ uh, substantially from those of the linearized problem. So even if you understand the linear problem, you still have to deduce a nonlinear problem. So anyway, you see there are lots of difficulties. And uh, here are the results which are known. So first of all, the only true result, nonlinear result, is the global stability of Minkowski space. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the asymptotically flat case here. So in the asymptotically flat regime, the global stability of Minkowski space, which uh, uh, of course it's only the case when A and M are equal to zero. So it's a very special care solution, right? The trivial care solution. So this is a constant case, which I think we understand very well. So the, the case of constant perturbation around the constant states is well understood today, I think. I mean, there are still problems, but mainly, I think, we could say that it's well understood. So the real challenge now is to do perturbations around uh, general stationary solutions. Now, uh, uh, another major result, uh, which is again at the linear level, so these are just the linearized equations, was due to Whiting in 1989, uh, where he, he proved the mode stability of the Kerr family. So no decay rates whatsoever, just uh, mode stability. So you, you do, you, you, you use a, uh, a separation of variable method and, and you show that each mod has behaves well. This, of course, does not mean at all that you can sum uh, the modes and get something which is reasonable. You can not even prove boundedness that way. But in any case, it was an important result. Now, uh, <laughs> the major, major uh, breakthrough uh, in, on this linear problem was obtained in recent years by the combined efforts of Sofer, Blue, Blue Sterbens, Da Fermos Rodniansky, Marzuola, Metcalf, Tetaru Tohonanu, Blue Anderson, Tetaru Tohonanu, etc., uh, which have led, so all these have led to a well, under, a well understanding of just the simplest possible linear equation, which is you, you, are, you look at the Kerr metric and you look at so this is the metric, and you look at just this equation in the exterior of the care solution, and you can prove all sorts of things about it. Highly non-trivial, because as I said, you have to solve this problem, has to deal with a ergo region problem, has to deal with a, uh, with a trap region, has to treat with the situation at infinity. There are also the fact that there are few uh, symmetries and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, and uh, this, by the way, was done originally only for small a. Uh, recent results, which were uh, announced by the Fermons and Rodniansky in 2010, hold for all, all a between uh, 0 and m. Right? So that's. Uh, okay, so uh, what I want to talk in the last, I don't know, five or six minutes, if I have, uh, if I can, uh, will be the work in progress on, with Ionescu and myself. Which, uh, so the idea is, I think there is no way right now to prove a uh, full stability issue. It's just too complicated. So, uh, uh, in, so anyway, we, we decided, and this was a de decision made uh, with Ionescu and also with Jeremy, uh, to really concentrate on the axially symmetry case. So, uh, so let me tell you uh, what one can do. So first of all, uh, uh, how, do, uh, how can you formulate the problem? Well, it turns out that if you have a space-time which has a killing vector field, which is axially symmetric, you have a reduction procedure. So the reduction is well known. I mean, there are many people who have uh, 
worked on it. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can uh, define a Nernst potential. So this is the Nernst po potential associated with the kinetic vector field, which has uh, a, a real and imaginary part. So has, uh, is defined by two functions, x and y. Uh, then the manifold itself can be expressed as, as a, a product between an SO2 and the manifold whose boundary, and 1 plus 2 will be a manifold whose boundary. Uh, and the metric uh, can be decomposed like this. There is a, an x times d phi, so phi corresponds to this rotation here in, in SO2. And then uh, you have a 2 plus 1 metric, so this will be a Lorentzian metric 2 plus 1. This is uh, x coming up from there, x minus 1. And this is a, a Lorentzian metric, h alpha beta, is a Lorentzian metric in, uh, the, in 2 plus 1 variables. You miss the dx somewhere. Excuse me? Oh, a square. Uh, yeah. The square after the parenthesis. You mean a square. You mean a square. Right. Uh, you need to write the metric, so it's just the first difference. Oh, d phi, yeah, sorry. This is, uh, this is out, yeah. This should be a squared here. Excuse me, yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah, so you define uh, the, uh, the, this w is, is defined by a, a curl, divergence curl system uh, in terms of x and y. And then uh, the important thing is that phi which is, again, the sense potential, uh, can be interpreted as a wave map from this manifold whose boundary to uh, the Poincaré disk H2. And uh, so phi itself satisfies an equation, which is tied to the metric H. And the metric H is tied to phi through this equation. So Ricci of the H is equal to that. Okay? So that's sort of a very simple uh, explanation. Now, uh, the wave map, in fact, takes this, play, takes this form. So it's x times the ambition with respect to g. Sorry, I, I should say, uh, the, this, this wave map phi is a wave map defined from n, n1 plus 2 with a metric h. But it also can be understood as a wave map defining the whole spacetime, mg, okay? with values in h2, which, which takes this form. So this is a metric. The, the original metric of, uh, of your axially symmetric uh, space time you started with. All right, so, <laughs> okay, so now this uh, turns out that it's still very difficult to do. So we don't have any claim right now that we can solve this problem, even this reduced uh, axially symmetric case. But what I think one can do is to look at simpler model problems associated with it. So one model problem is the following. Take the metric G, so take the metric G here, okay? <coughs> so, sorry, the metric G here. Take the metric G to be the Kerr metric, okay? Then uh, uh, you have a wave map, and a particular solution of the wave map is going to be given by the nth potential of the Kerr solution, right? So you have a Kerr solution here with an A and an M, and you have the nth potential corresponding exactly to that one. That's a special solution. So you want to perturb that one. So, so you have a perturbation, a true nonlinear perturbation of a stationary solution, but assuming that the metric is kept fixed. Okay? So, uh, uh, so that's model problem number one. Model problem number two, uh, which is something that I'm discussing with Jeremy, is uh, to prove the stability of the Kerr solution among axially symmetric polarized perturbations. So what that means is that you look for special solutions which have y exactly equal to 0. In that case, you see the, the equation simplifies quite a bit. And uh, uh, in fact, the stability, of, uh, stability in this case really is the stability of the Schwarzschild solution in the class of polarizers. So in, in other words, the final state is going to be a, a Schwarzschild solution, not a Kerr solution. So a will be 0. Now, this will lead to all sorts of simplifications, and it's a problem that uh, we think is doable. We don't know how to do it yet, <laughs> but uh, at least we think that uh, maybe in the next uh, 10 years uh, this will be solved. Now, uh, okay. now uh, the problem that I think, right, so I, I'll finish with this. The, the problem that I think we can solve, and this is a work in progress with UNESCO, is a first model problem. So the first model problem, again, you take g to be Kerr, you take x, and you try to perturb the nth potential of the Kerr solution. All right, so, so this is how it looks in bohr with coordinates. This is a Kerr solution. The nth potential is exactly a is equal to sigma, so sigma being uh, defined here, 
sigma squared times sine square of theta divided by q squared. And b is this ugly expression here. Right? So this is the second part of the. Right? Now, of course, a and b, a and b are special solutions, stationary solutions of these equations. And I want to perturb a and b, so I, what I want to do uh, is to, and this is a conjecture uh, which we think we can solve, uh, though it's still work in progress. Uh, so you look at the whole system, and you take solutions which are small perturbations of that a and b that we saw in the previous slide. Right? So the a and b that we saw here. Right? So, uh, uh, and uh, the claim is that uh, the perturbation, so if you perturb uh, x0, y0, uh, the perturbation converges back to phi0. Okay? So this is one of the special cases where you actually converge back. So modulation is not necessary, which is remarkable in its own right. You converge to exactly the same thing. And uh, uh, we have, uh, can I have maybe two more minutes? All right. All right, so here is a, the conjecture is that, that uh, the, uh, the final, the solution of the nonlinear problem converges to the solution of the, of the, to the nth potential of the Kerr solution. And uh, uh, I just want to say a few words about uh, uh, why, what's, what's interesting here? Well, you see, if you li look at the linear, if you linearize, you linearize like this. You take a and b, and you add the perturbation, which is expressed like this. It has an a in it because the perturbation has to be zero on the axis of the symmetry, right? So that's why I need an a here. So uh, you, here is an ugly system that you get. So you see, it's a it's a system in which you have. It, it's linear in psi, derivative of psi in phi. It's very complicated. So a priori. This is very far, as far as possible, from the ambition of phi and the ambition of psi is equal to 0, which is a case which was understood. So the linearized problem is much more complicated than the linearized problem which was, on, which was uh, understood by the Fermat, Ronyansky, and many others. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, this is a picture. You start up with initial condition here for, for the phi and psi, which is a perturbation. And you want to prove that you can cover all these regions. Now, uh, the reason, uh, so these are the challenges, uh, uh, which maybe I won't say much more. I'll say only one thing is uh, the most important supporting evidence uh, for one is the fact that there exists an energy momentum tensor for that complicated linearized equations, which has these three properties. It's positive. So it's an energy momentum tensor which depends on, on psi. So psi is the perturbation. So psi is this perturbation, phi psi. It depends, of course, on derivative of psi. But of course, it depends also on the nth potential of the Kerr solution, which is phi 0 d phi 0. So it's a complicated thing. But it's positive. It, it has a divergence expression, but with a source term on the right-hand side, and which, of course, could be extremely dangerous. So in fact, the, the, the main point is exactly the source, because in principle, you could write a source starting up with just a linear wave equation. But this would be a terrible source. So uh, the idea is that you can find a good energy momentum tensor with a j on the right-hand side, which is perpendicular to the, killing, to the, uh, to the uh, stationary, I'm sorry, this should be z here. It's killing to the, uh, sorry, it's killing to the, Excuse me. It's killing to the uh, stationary vector field, which is uh, the dt of the Kerr solution, right? So we, we are still in a, the metric is still the Kerr metric here. So this is uh, the most important thing, because as a corollary of this, you, st you still have an energy conservation for the linearized system. Because how do you prove energy conservation? You multiply q by t, and you take its divergence. But because, because t cancel the j, you still get a conservation law. So you get a positive conservation law. And this is sort of the beginning of everything. In addition, you can prove more of its estimates. So this is a second proposition that we can prove so far. Uh, this is a trap region. It turns out that the trap region, because you are in the axially symmetric case, the trap region is still relatively simple. In other words, it consists on just one, one surface, r equal r star. And, uh, and uh, you can do the Moravets type estimate, which is a crux of the matter in 
in this linear stability issues of Da Fermos, Rodniansky and, and uh, company, uh, the most important estimate was this Moravec estimate. Uh, this Moravec estimate <laughs> could be a problem because again J is very complicated. There is no reason that J will, uh, will go for the right. It turns out that he does. And you can prove that more of its estimate. And as a consequence, you can prove conformal decay estimates and, uh, and uh, uniform decay estimates and so on and so forth. So I'll stop here. Are there questions? No questions? Please. Uh, so the, the model problem two. That yes. you mentioned. So this, if this were to be solved, this corresponds to proving stability of Schwarzschild within the set of data which has, which is which is polarized. Which is polarized. But if I try to express them in terms of the parameters, let's say n and a, this means that I'm trying to perturb Schwarzschild while keeping a is a zero. A is fixed. Yes. Okay. This is right. equivalent. Right. I should say that 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 uh, Holzegel, Dafermos, and Ronyansky have sort of a different program, which is moving it also in that direction. So, uh, so it's good that we have two different points of view because uh, th these problems are extremely hard. Now, in higher dimensions, all, all this formalism uh, with um, double null decomposition and stuff like that is not well understood yet. Maybe there is something like that, but uh, you expect that. Uh, Wave equation, solution of wave equation decay faster, and therefore maybe the stability problem would be easier for black holes? No, no, not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily, because there are these other f fundamental problems which have to do with, uh, with uh, ergo region, that has to do with, you know, uniqueness itself is a problem, right? Rigidity is much more difficult in higher dimensions, so even. Uh, rigidity obviously has to be an important aspect of the of the stability problem, right? Because if, of course, if there were other stationary solutions, then who knows where, where you would converge, right? So, uh, uh, so rigidity is very important. Of course, rigidity you uh, you don't have in higher dimensions. So I, I, I don't know. I think there will be other problems in higher dimensions. Decay is easier. It's true if you can prove decay, <laughs> which is uh, a major challenge. More questions? Okay, so thank you very much. In, in some cases, one could uh, combine analytical results with numerical results to prove theorems. Now, there are numerical, many numerical experiments showing the stability of curve. Yes. So is it possible to think that one could combine uh, some numerical information of the stability with an estimate, and then one could get the proof at the end? Well, everything is possible, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, these problems are incredibly difficult, the, the stability. And in fact, actually, looking at the physics literature, I've never seen a reason. I mean, people look at the linearized problem, and they say the linearized problem is somewhat stable. But there is no reason. Of course, in a very energetic situations, and they stabilize to a curve like all. Yeah, but these are always special initial data, right? I mean, it's a. It's a <laughs> but there is no. But a mechanism. I want to know a physical mechanism why it should be non-linearly stable. I mean, I've never seen one. And, and this, by the way, our first result I think gives you something because it's very much tied to the positivity of the curvature on the target manifold, which is hyperbolic space. It's intimately tied to that. So it's, it, at least you can see sort of beginning of a mechanism of non-linear stability. Linear stability, of course, by linear, what does linear stability mean? Right? Because whenever you do linear stability, you pick up a gauge. And you know, it's gauge dependent. So it's not, unless you prove non-linear stability, you can't really say anything. Yeah. So, so how, how would you prove that it's not stable? I mean, so is presuming that it's linearly stable. Well, I, we want to prove that it's stable, so. I know, I know but how we can, <laughs> I mean, just by the fact that you say, I mean, there's tons of work going on on this on the stability, right. and if people can't prove it, that doesn't show that it's not stable. I'm wondering, is there some mathematical thing that would argue, yes, we now know that? No, I mean, I think we are starting to see reasons why it should be stable, but of course, only the axial asymmetric case, at least, I mean, as far as I can tell. Uh, of course, the Fermos Rodniansky have something else but it's still tied to the, the Schwarzschild solution, to the actual Schwarzschild solution. So, uh, yeah, I think we are just at the beginning of the game here. In 10 years, I think if you ask the question in 10 years, we'll be able to give you a, a decent answer. 
No more questions? Oh. Il n'y aura pas de chauffeur. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, we hope so. Provided, provided that we get the money. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so thank you very much.